So welcome everyone. My name is Kirsten Loita and I head up our university relations team here at Osage University Partners. I am so glad that so many of you are joining us for this first webinar in a series of webinars on academic startup licenses, which has been developed as a resource for entrepreneurs working at companies, originated academic institutions, as well as tech transfer offices to help them with their startup negotiations. Today, we have three panelists with us, each um, bring a different perspective to this conversation. Uh, in order for you to have <clears throat> understand what those perspectives are, I'll have them introduce themselves. Rick, do you want to start us off? Sure. Thanks, Kirsten. Hi, welcome everyone to today's presentation into the webinar series. My name is Rick Friedman. I was initially trained as a Silicon Valley corporate lawyer and made a career pivot 16 years ago when I joined UT Austin's Office of Technology Commercialization as a technology manager. At first, universities were a real mystery to me, but after nine years working inside two universities and collaborating with many others, I grew to appreciate why they function the way they do. And I'm hopeful that this webinar series will help demystify tech transfer for those of you who are new to it. I returned to the practice of law seven years ago. And since then I've been on the opposite side of the table now representing startups that are forming around university IP and licensing it from the universities. And I recently founded Novus GC, a law firm dedicated to providing general counsel services to emerging and life science companies. Representing startups formed around university IP is a major component of our practice, and I feel really fortunate to have the opportunity to help founders build commercial enterprises from their innovations. And I'm grateful to be here today with Kirsten, Lisa, Nikisha, and all of you in the audience. Great. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Nikisha. My name is Nikisha Holder. Hello, everyone. I'm an Associate Director of Licensing at Johns Hopkins Technology Ventures with a focus on life science-based technologies. I've been a member of the JHU community for collectively 19 years and specifically with Tech Transfer for 13. My role allows me to utilize the skills and knowledge I've gained through attaining my PhD in molecular genetics from JHU, my love of science, negotiating and just doing to deal to make an impact specifically in the healthcare space. And it puts me squarely in the intersection of science and business. Thank you everyone. And hi, <laughs> Thanks, hi, I'm Lisa Norton, an associate director with Commotion, the University of Washington's technology transfer office. And like many of my tech transfer colleagues in the US and around the world, I have a background both in research and in business. I joined Commotion about 16 years ago now and came to the office after working in a local startup. And really I've always been interested in the way to take research, applied research from the bench out into the public. I love that my job means that I get to do that all the time. I get to work with really highly motivated, extremely bright researchers and help them find or create new ways to expedite that work going from a project to a product. I'm really excited today to work with everybody on this call and also to talk about some of the ways we can accomplish that goal and set everybody up for success. Great, thank you, Lisa. Thank you all. Um, I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. And before we dive into the substance of the webinar, just a few notes. Um, first, the panelists on this webinar, first of all, you can see that they all come from different backgrounds. They're representing um, different facets here regarding uh, startup licenses and startup negotiations. Um, but they spent a lot of time developing this series of webinars that we're going to be giving, from outlining it to creating the substance of it. So um, <clears throat> Rick, Nikisha, and Lisa, really thank you so much for all the time that you've already spent on this. And I know you're gonna be spending on it in the coming months too, as we re-roll these different webinars out. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this webinar is being recorded and will be available to both our partner institutions um, by the, via the, our partner portal, which is currently just available to our te the tech transfer offices that work with us, but we're actually working on a version that's also available to researchers as well. Um, and also on our YouTube channel. So you'll be able to download it either one of these places and then all the people re who have registered for this will send the slides to you as well. As we're going through the webinar today, you'll see a Q&A feature down at the bottom um, down here um, uh, that you can use to ask questions of our panelists. Um, feel free to um, put in the questions at any point and I'll moderate and, and provide those questions to them as we go along. So next slide. So, Today's um, it, webinar is our first um, webinar in this series, and it's a high level view about academic startup licenses. So we're kind of giving you a 30,000 foot view 
about academic startup licenses. We'll discuss information that is important for both the university and the startup to know when entering into the negotiation for what will hopefully be a long-term relationship. Uh, in our next webinar of the series, which is gonna be on March 23rd, um, and we'll be sending out registration information for that soon, we'll review the license process and pre-license agreements, such as material transfer agreements, option agreements, um, confidentiality agreements, et cetera. Our third webinar in the series will review the term sheet that many tech transfer offices use prior to drafting the full license agreement, as well as review the types of financial information uh, that is typically included in the license. The fourth webinar, and I forgot, the third webinar is gonna be on May 18th. Uh, we already have that one scheduled. The fourth webinar is probably gonna be sometime in July, we're guessing. Uh, we're trying to do these every two months. Um, and for that one, we'll be begin our dive into specific clauses from license agreements that are often heavily negotiated um, with startups. Uh, so we're gonna talk about uh, reservations of rights, sublicensing, change of control, reporting and termination. And it's not just actually even sometimes negotiation we're talking about here, but a lot, a lot of questions come up um, around these uh, sec se sections. Um, and then the last session uh, that we'll have in the series is what we're calling the lawyer parts. Uh, and this includes indemnities, warranties, liabilities, patent enforcement, patent prosecution, ownership of IP, name use, et cetera. And that'll be, uh, we'll be rounding off this series in September. So we hope you'll stick with us for all of them, but we also realize that you may not be able to make all of them, but like we said before, they're being recorded and you can review these at a later time. So next slides, please. <clears throat> so, first of all, why did we develop this set of webinars? I talked about this a little bit at the beginning, but I really want to dive into it here. So all the people who are our panelists have been involved um, uh, and spent countless hours explaining many of the same policies and provisions to new entrepreneurs spinning out technologies from academic institutions. And the quest questions asked are valid. For example, why does the university ask for indemnity? Why can't the intellectual property be assigned to the startup? So we hope these webinars can be used as a guide and a resource to save some, first of all, some valuable uh, dollars to a startup that often spends a lot of time being educated either by attorneys or other people in um, their networks, as well as validation that the majority of US institutions work in similar ways on many of the licensing provisions uh, that we'll discuss. And, and we'll explain the reasons why behind those. So on the tech transfer side, we hope that these webinars will be a resource in helping you establish successful long-term relationships with your startups. Uh, we know how limited everyone's time is and how important it is to move forward in a timely and positive manner uh, in getting these, uh, these licenses done and getting that long-term relationship started. So next slide. So we wanna talk about a little bit about the approach um, to these webinars um, before we dive into the substance. So our approach on these webinars is based on using a combination of people from various backgrounds who've already introduced themselves to, to provide that insider baseball knowledge on the areas we'll review. So today, especially, we'll note the drivers of both the university and the startup and how that prepares them for what they are hoping and success of the company. Um, successful startups from universities are typically based on long-term collaborative relationships uh, between the parties. And the best way to establish that long-term relationship is by putting your best foot forward uh, in the beginning. And so we're gonna be talking about um, that over these next uh, few, few webinars. So the negotiation between the university and the company founders and investors is, is a process of discovery. So what is driving each side? Um, what are their expectations? And negotiations in general, it shouldn't be seen as a fight. Um, they're a way of coming to solution, to understanding each other's perspective and say, perspectives and saying, here's how we can get to a solution. So before we dive into the substance of today, we wanna to really set the stage. Um, and I'd like to ask each, each of our panels to provide a brief story um, for how this process can work in success. So Elisa, would you like to start us off? Of course, thanks. Yeah, about five years ago, after interviewing a number of CEOs with one of my research teams, a startup was created and they initially licensed about 12 technologies from our office for a new medical ultrasound device. That license now has almost 50 patents, as well as a very large portfolio of software, images, and materials. And the team and the startup have collaborated on multiple grants. The company has sponsored research back into the lab. And in fact, today, I'm currently amending the license again to add in some of those new additional technologies. And really, the key to the success here has been that 
as the startup has gone through all the usual iterations, especially this past year in terms of timelines, they've worked together with us. We've had great communication from the beginning. We've been able to continue that from that point. And so at any time where there needed to be a change, we just had this great relationship to go back on. And so those changes have been really straightforward. And I think sometimes it gets forgotten that the negotiation isn't the end of the relationship. And so um, that's something that, that I hope anybody listening to this will remember because it can really be key. These are long-term relationships and I, some, I think that sometimes can get forgotten. So establish them the way that you hope that they'll go on whenever possible. That's great advice. Thanks, Lisa. Nikisha. Well, I have a little bit of a different perspective. So JCHU is quite proud of Thrive Earlier Detection Corp. It's a 2019 JCHU startup out of a laboratory of Bert Vogelstein, Kenneth Kinsler, and Nicholas Papadopoulos. And this is based on their cancer seek liquid biopsy test. So the startup was actually really hard to have towards having its blood tests incorporated into routine medical care so that it could detect more cancers and at earlier stages and, and perhaps enable, enable quicker treatment um, um, when, it, uh, when it was actually acquired earlier this month by Exact Sciences for just over two billion. So we were hopeful that this particular startup would lead to a long-term relationship, but we were quite pleased that the startup was able to actually move to an acquisition. So in this particular situation, we're very pleased that success will hopefully be kept interest. So JHU has technologies that are available and we are helping to promote startups. And so although Thrive was acquired, this success hopefully has opened the door for other groups that are interested in looking to understand how they can commercialize other assets in the JHU unlicensed portfolio. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that we'll have lots of entrepreneurs knocking at our door now. That's great. That's a, that's a really terrific success story. Thanks, Nikisha. Rick. Uh, I don't think it's widely known outside the tech transfer circles, but Google has tech transfer lineage. I want to spend a minute talking about that. It wasn't something I was personally involved with. Kirsten probably can tell more from, from her days at Stanford. But grad students Larry Page and Sergey Brin developed the PageRank algorithm while working under grants from NSF and DARPA at Stanford. And Stanford filed the patent on it. They marketed the patent to the leading search players of the time. This is a little over two decades ago, but they didn't get any serious takers. So Page and Brin formed Google, took a license from Stanford, and got venture funding. And as well as being technical innovators, Page and Brin were corporate innovators, and they validated the model of university researchers forming and leading commercial enterprises, which was a lot rarer two decades ago when they did it and has become commonplace today. And I expect many of you in the audience are doing exactly that. And in many cases, an experienced managed team from day one makes a lot of sense. But the model of researcher led companies is thriving now. And there are more resources than ever to support researchers who are first time founders. And I, you know, I've been in tech transfer for 16 years, and, uh, you know, both sides now, and I've seen many researchers who have been successful in it. And I think it's part of that attitude that Kirsten mentioned, mentioned earlier, it's that, you know, the, the process of discovery and bringing into it that curiosity to understand how the different parts work. Um, and is why to maybe empathy is a good word, just listening and understanding um, to, to make everyone successful. That's a really good point, Rick. A lot of um, negotiating um, is, listening and, and understanding. We've talked about uh, understanding each other's perspectives when you're um, entering into these negotiations. So thanks. Those were all terrific stories uh, and a great way to set us up and to really start dive into the meat of today. So uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So uh, here are the four main questions that we're going to uh, answer today. So what is technology transfer? Why do universities and companies enter into these agreements in the first place? Uh, who are the key stakeholders on each side? And this is pretty complex on the, on the university side. And then what do the stakeholders expect of the negotiation of the li and license? And we didn't include a last question here, but we're also gonna talk about some different ways um, that we think are success factors in going forward too. So let's, uh, let's jump right into question number one. Next slide. Um, so what is technology transfer? Rick, do you want to start us off with some, some definitions and some background on this? Sure. 
the focus of this webinar series is the transfer of technology from universities to startups form to commercialize that technology. And there's two important points I want to make about this. The first has to do with patents. University tech transfer doesn't always involve patents, but it often does. And the type of license terms we're going to be discussing in this webinar in detail when we start getting to the third session are most commonly associated with patent licenses. But there, there are other things where maybe it's just software. Um, and in my experience, the nature of patent rights is widely misunderstood. For example, on more than one occasion, I've seen founders surprised to learn that a patent license doesn't protect them from being sued for infringement of other patents. They thought the patent license provided a right to make products and immunity from lawsuits. Or I've seen founders surprised to learn that the patent covers only a narrow element of the technology. The, the nature of patent rights and what patents do or don't do is beyond the scope of this webinar series. So if you're new to patents and are gonna be founding a company based on university patents, it's well worth an investment of time to gain a basic understanding of the nature of patent rights. The, the USPTO website can be a good starting point on patent basics, and we provided a link to that in this slide. Uh, your, your patent prosecution lawyer can also be a real asset understanding the nature of the patents you're getting and, and developing a patent strategy. That's the first point is just the, kind of the central part that patents play in it. And as a founder, being able to really wrap your head around that. The second point is that rarely are two tech transfer deals alike. Tech transfer can be the license of a single issued patent and that's it. Or it can be a much deeper relationship of the types that Nikisha and Lisa discussed earlier that involve maybe larger IP portfolios and collaboration between the university and the company you know, over a number of years. And similarly, the economics of the transactions, as we'll discuss starting in a couple, in two sessions from now, generally are tailored to the specific technology licensed and the way it's being commercialized by the company. And so, you know, my takeaway from this is that tech transfer is rarely cookie cutter and it does need, per, you know, a real attention to the specifics of the particular transaction. And there's one other point in this slide, which we'll talk about a little later, which tech transfer we're talking about is almost always involving a license and not ownership. And we'll get into the reasons for that in later slides. And I think Nikisha will now tell us more about how universities are organized to support Thanks. technology transfer. Thanks, Rick. So although technology transfer can occur business to business, today we'll be speaking to technology transfer with universities and startups. So in general, technology transfer offices will work with faculty, staff, and students of the university to commercialize the technology via direct licenses to either large, medium, or small established companies, or for the purpose of this, this seminar series, startups. And many of these startups will have at least one inventor of the technology involved in the startup in some way, be it as a founder, as a scientific advisor, and in some cases as uh, CEOs or CFOs or whatever the case may be. Um, some of those technologies could be funded by a sponsor uh, or sponsored by a company, which might lead to a natural license to that particular sponsor. Um, or there might be a material transfer where the company and university will provide materials to one another um, and perhaps there will be an invention, a discovery, or of results that, uh, that come from the transfer of that material. Well, at the end of the day, once we have the technology disclosed to the office, we'll work to evaluate the technology to determine if it is patentable. Although I will say not all technologies need to be patentable in order to be valuable. Uh, we also wanna determine its market potential. We'll market the technology, um, and once we have interest by a startup or other commercial entity, we will enter into a confidentiality agreement. And this really helps protect all parties' interests. Finally, hopefully there is a negotiation and execution of a license at the end of the day, which uh, starts the long-term relationship of the university with the company. Now, in particular, right now, many TTOs ha will have accelerators, and we'll speak a little bit more to this later or venture resources that are provided by the university to help facilitate faculty-led startups. Some will have funding while others are simply a resource that provides training, space, mentors and residents to connect potential inventor or university faculty and staff with the innovation community. 
Next slide. <laughs> Thanks, Nikisha and Kirsten. So with all these options and resources, we often hear that universities are hard to navigate. We certainly understand that. And so we've outlined a few ways to suggest that you begin working together. If you have a particular researcher that you know you'd like to work with in a particular technology or an area of research that they're working in, sometimes the best thing to do is contact that researcher directly. You can certainly also contact the Tech Transfer Office and see if we're managing any technologies on behalf of that researcher. But I would suggest going to the researcher directly as your first route. And if you're interested in a technology space but maybe aren't sure which particular researcher you're interested in, talk to their department as a first step. Hopefully then, if those conversations are fruitful and you're interested in collaborating or potentially sponsoring research, maybe co-applying for a grant, you'd likely want to contact the grants office. That can be co-located with the Tech Transfer Office or it can be a separate entity. So again, if you'd like, Tech Transfer can certainly direct you to the right place. And then of course, Tech Transfer is the place that you're going to go if you're licensing an agreement or if you want to talk about an option, you're interested in what patents or other intellectual property may be around that technology. We're happy to be that resource. That's what we do. And if we're not the right place, we're happy to direct you to somebody who is for your questions. And then something that I think is uh, less utilized but still happens with some frequency is that if your company has a technology that you're hoping that the university is going to license in or a service that you hope that they'll use, that usually goes through the purchasing office. And so that would be the first place that you'd contact there. And in any case, I always recommend asking, is this the right office for my question? If not, it's a really easy way for somebody to be able to redirect you. Once you get to the right place, I highly recommend asking what their process is, whether there um, are any standard timelines, sometimes not, but sometimes there are. There usually are potential delaying elements. Knowing what those are upfront can be really helpful. And then understanding the best route to an agreement can also be really useful. Hopefully the office is gonna tell you what things are easier for them to do and more challenging. And as we'll talk about later, there are some things that unfortunately we just can't offer. And so knowing what those are at the outset can really just expedite your process. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so, you know, and, and I think that sets a really good stage on kind of the, the context that we <laughs> that we're that we're working from. Just to let you know, your tech transfer office may not be called the tech transfer office. There are lots of different names um, uh, for tech technology transfer offices. It may involve uh, something about uh, uh, ventures, innovation, development. Sorry, <laughs> what? what? Promotion. Promotion, yeah, right. <laughs> UW is promotion. Um, so, but usually if you just Google the university's name and tech transfer, it's going to get you to the right place. <laughs> so speaking of Google. <laughs> um, all right, <laughs> slide 13. Uh, so now we're on to, we're going to go to the next uh, part, the next question or this. So why do universities and com companies enter into these license agreements? Uh, it may seem like a really simple question, but understanding the motives and perspectives will help you to get to a good, well thought out, reasonable uh, deal. So on the next slide, Lisa and Rick are going to talk about the missions of universities and companies, uh, which will, will include some of the major ways that they're, they're different with each other. Yeah, and Lisa? I think the title of this slide is really the key point. Universities and companies do have different missions, and by understanding those differences, it can really help to break down this idea that one side or the other is crazy. Um, for example, universities have a research and education mission, and it's really by presenting and publishing their ideas that a university thrives and is able to attract other excellent researchers and attract commercial entities as well. Much of the research is curiosity driven and it's led by the goals of the research. And Rick, if you'd speak to the company's perspective and how that can differ, that would be great. Um, yeah, so on the, on the particular missions, um, you know, for the company standpoint, it's developing, trying to develop something that's proprietary, might need to keep things secret. Um, so these are all things that can, can create tensions between uh, the university's perspective and the company perspective. And we'll, we'll address that when we get later into the series and how that's addressed. But there can also be other places where attention comes up. For example, the ongoing research in the lab that a company licenses a particular technology and the lab is continuing to do work in the area that the company may see as competitive. And, and how you 
you know, how you address that. So there are these, so in, in, I'd say in a lot of ways, from a mission standpoint, there you can see great alignment between the universities bringing something so far and handing it off to the companies to then uh, bring the, put the, put the technology into practical use. On the other hand, there are these areas of tension. Yeah. And we also frequently have questions about confidentiality and publication, especially with our researchers who are interested in having their work be commercialized. And certainly as a public research university, we're never gonna tell somebody not to publish. That's absolutely germane to our mission. Uh, we do like it if they talk to us first so that we can help them protect it maybe before they present or publish wherever possible. And I think that's sometimes something that many companies understand, although they would like it to be different. <laughs> they would like us to be able to hold things secret or confidential. And uh, for us, we have to stay true to our mission. The one other, I get, the one other thing I'd like to highlight on this slide is it's a little less about mission and it's more about structure. And it's the last point about universities about um, the decentralized nature of universities. And this can be a real shock to people coming from an industry background. In industry, if the CEO and the board support a deal, the company generally falls in line and gets the deal done. Universities are very different. And there can be many voices in a particular deal. There's, there's going to be the researchers will often have a voice in it, a strong voice. Um, there's the tech transfer office, the sponsored research office, maybe. There's legal. There can be compliance. Um, so there's, there's all these different parties um, that, that have a voice and, and frankly can say, no, you can't do that. And we're not going to do that. And uh, now, if a faculty member wants to get a deal done, often the different offices, you know, will pull together and, and do their best to get a deal done, but they're not going to necessarily bend to the will of the faculty member. And doing a university deal can require a lot more patience and, and more collaborative approach than in a typical industry industry deal. And I've seen collaborative CEOs really thrive in this environment and, you know, work through it. And I've seen more dictatorial CEOs kind of blow up and not make it through the gauntlet. Yep. Um, and and the one other thing I want to just comment on this is this decentralized nature of the universities also means the license deal is generally only going to encompass some very specific IP coming out of one specific lab and not anything else across the university. And that's something where some surprises some people sometimes to think, well, you're the TTO, just you know, give me a non-exclusive license to everything you have. And right. not that simple. Oh, and it's not always a non-exclusive license. You know, we, we frequently get asked for an exclusive license to, uh, let's say it's everything cancer related. And um, it's, it's not possible for us to know everything that's going on, much less have the rights to be able to write that kind of agreement. We absolutely understand why a company would want it, but really that's the reason that we can't deliver on it. Great, uh, next slide then. Sure, so with this background, Nikisha and I are gonna talk a little bit more about what motivates universities to enter into licenses and to do technology transfer. One of the main things is that it's an extension of our research mission, which is really to translate university research into goods and services that benefit society. And that societal benefit can be academic, that could be through open source software, it can be consumer-based products, it can be therapeutics and diagnostics or new engines, other kinds of new devices. It might be world health related. I mean, really the list just goes on and on. And some of those benefits also translate into economic development. Universities really are one of the largest engines of economic growth. And uh, Nikisha, if you continue to discuss some of those aspects. Sure, next is job creation. So job creation is an extensive economic development piece that Lisa just mentioned. And in particular, there's a 2017 article in The Hill where it noted Census Bureau data that indicated started created jobs at five times the rate of a traditional company. I also mentioned Thrive earlier. You can tell we're very pleased with that. Um, I'd like to note that in its first two years, they hired just over 100 employees as of the date of its acquisition. That's pretty phenomenal with respect to economic development and job creation in the university's uh, general location. Uh, there are also funding requirements. So many funders may have a commercialization requirement associated with that funding agreement. 
So therefore, it's not only to the benefit of the university, but a requirement that they at least try to find uh, a commercial partner for each technology. Finally, for recruit recruitment and retention, uh, quite frankly, universities that are well known for its startups may be able to recruit and retain faculty based on the reputation and success of its startups alone. Everybody wants to be where perhaps the money is. More and more researchers are also putting a focus on entrepreneurship. So it's very interesting to note that uh, about 67 academic universities nationally have unanimously voted to approve a set of recommendations for recognizing innovation and entrepreneurial achievements among the criteria for higher education faculty promotion and, ten and tenure. Uh, so this proposal is not to add a fourth prong to our traditional three prong of teaching, research, and service, but rather to um, place innovation and entrepreneurship within those three prongs. So I think Lisa is going to talk a little bit about uh, Autumn. That's right. So I'm going to talk about what are called the nine points to consider. And almost 15 years ago, a number of universities came together to brainstorm about important societal, policy, legislative, and other issues in university technology transfer. And this resulted in the nine points that you see here. And the reason that we're including them as some further considerations is that they might be underlying a university's position in a negotiation or agreement. And so they're important to have and have some understanding of. I'm not gonna read through them all, just to highlight one though. Uh, exclusive licenses should be structured in a manner that encourages technology development and use. This means if you are looking for an exclusive license from the university, anticipate that there are gonna be development milestones in that exclusive license. And the reason for that is we wanna make sure that the research that has been created actually gets out to the public. We wanna make sure that it's not gonna be shelved and um, that if there's some reason that development isn't occurring, that we have language around that in the agreement so that it can be a discussion with the company about how we could potentially make that change or um, you know, uh, if the license needs to be different to do that. I highly recommend if you're interested in this, the list can be found on the Autumn website and not only the list, but it also has the rationale for each point. And that really gives some additional insight into the university perspective. So we've added the link here if you're interested in going to look at that and, and really I do highly recommend reading through the rationale. It just gives you a little bit more knowledge about what we're thinking. Well, and then I'll, I take, <laughs> I'll take this one. Um, startup side. We, I don't think we have a slide in terms of the research that's done at US universities. I think it's about $50 billion a year. It's sort of that's order of magnitude. So there's all this research. The US universities are spending tens of billions of dollars on research every year. And there's this great wealth of scientific and technical talent inside these universities. So you know, from the from the private from the startup side, the equation is pretty simple. It's hey, we have this great potential source of innovation and talent if we can tap into that. And the universities have developed infrastructure, as we've been discussing. There, they have the infrastructure to help support the startups and move it out, uh, and are and are very open to that. So that's why universities can be a great place to to get technology to move out. And I, I, the, the recent numbers, I think, the recent autumn numbers, I think are showing about a thousand uh, spin out licenses a year or something. So it's, you know, it's a decent magnitude and it's been growing um, pretty progressively uh, over the last, you know, many years. Uh, the, the and, and I'd say the only thing else I wanna add on this slide is just the university halo effect. I mean, sometimes, you know, sometimes you wanna get the technology and honestly, sometimes there are people saying, hey, I wanna be associated with the university um, and it's worth it for me. And I'm gonna be you know, working with them. I'm gonna be you know, building on the technology. I'm gonna be working with the researchers and that provides some validation uh, that there's, there's some there there behind the startup. So, so Rick, there's a question uh, from the audience and I'm, I'm gonna direct it to you first and then Lisa and Nikisha, feel free to chime in too. So this is a question from uh, someone who says, um, so if I wanted to be a startup founder, could I examine existing research at the university and then approach the, the researcher in the university about attempting to start a company utilizing the research or would I have to ha already have a company and then approach those entities? So Rick, go ahead. Well, yeah, the answer is definitely number one. 
Yeah, yeah. You, because you can you can be absolutely forming the company around it. And there's a sort of a process in advance of discovery. And, you know, often it doesn't make sense from from a lawyer's standpoint. It doesn't make sense to start the company until you even have your thesis. And the tech transfer offices understand that. And when the time is right, you know, you may form a company and maybe well, we'll get into it in the next one, but execute an option and, you know, go from there. Yeah. Well, maybe that yeah. works with SPACs, um, but, but for licensing from universities, <laughs> typically you're going to, you're going to know kind of what you're, what, what it is you're trying to achieve and, and the intellectual property you're trying to achieve it with. And that's how you do the license. So Nikisha, I'm sorry. I didn't yeah, that you were no, I would agree. Um, if you are uh, an entrepreneur that's interested in perhaps looking at some specific things around university technologies, I would suggest you reach out to perhaps the technology transfer office or look at the tech transfer research uh, offices page and they may have listings of technologies that are currently available for licensing. If you have a specific indication, you could say, hey, can you send me a list of technologies for researchers that are specifically working in this area? And it provides, an, again, a first touch point for you to be connected to those people in those areas. So reaching out to your tech transfer office or perusing their pages could be really helpful. Definitely, and we've had entrepreneurs join our mentor network. And so there have been uh, at least a handful of times where there being an entrepreneur, getting to attend additional events, sometimes judging our grants competitions have led to a direct interest in a particular line of research that they've then started a company around. In fact, I think one of our entrepreneurs has started himself either four or five. So it just can be a great introduction into the university. It can also be a great way to see how they function, how they set up their agreements. Um, and if you're willing to dedicate your time like that, um, gives you some more options, more insight, more just direct time with researchers in a different setting than you would have if you were immediately approaching them directly about an agreement. So there are multiple ways in. Uh, I highly recommend utilizing the one that suits you best in terms of what you're interested in at that time. And, and I'll just point out too, from the opposite side, you know, the researchers are often looking for those entrepreneurs to help, help them take this forward. So, um, you know, they're experts on, you know, being researchers and getting and getting their particularly their um, area of expertise forward. Uh, but they may not be experts on the business side and they, they potentially need that help, which is why there's lots of resources that for them potentially at the university to do that, but also um, just talent, having the talent uh, particularly to drive that um, particular uh, um, technology forward is, is necessary too. So um, good question. Uh, we have another question. Actually, we have two other questions. I'm going to have you think about one of them over the next the course of the, the next part of this. But one of the questions that well, I think you can answer now is um, one issue that we encounter is timing of license execution. We like to execute a letter of intent for option, uh, which allows the startup to seek financing, move, ter move to term sheet and license negotiation when there is at least verbal commitment from investors to ensure the company has resources to develop the technology. What is your perspective on the timing and how have you addressed this issue? So I think it's really about timing of, of when, when you should you uh, be doing that early, you know, the, the kind of pre-license agreements, when should you be doing the license agreement, et cetera, um, and and Zinkisha, I see you nodding your head. Um, I'll have you address that one first, and then Lisa and Rick. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I think if a, a a venture or a new company has, um, I guess, a commitment of funding from uh, some type of investor, that's always very helpful. I mean, as we know, and we'll talk about it later, um, money is definitely needed to make sure that the te technology is being developed further. Um, I think once uh, a company has a general idea of what it is you want to license, a plan for moving it forward, and a plan for funding it, it's the time to approach the, the licensing office. And if it makes sense to do an option or a pre-license um, letter of intent, then that certainly can happen. Um, alternatively, uh, depending upon the timing of the funding, um, it might be appropriate to do a license. So every situation is going to be unique to the technology and to the development plan for that individual tech. Yeah, great. Yep. Uh, I think this is, sure, again, I think this is a situation of timing. I think one key thing to note is that many entrepreneurs are sure that the technology that they've become interested in must have 10 other interested parties. And from the tech transfer and the researcher side, I would say we would love that to be true. Um, it's rarely the case that you are directly fighting with, you know, four or five 
any other people for the same technology. So if you enjoy working with the researcher, they enjoy working with you, that can be as good as, if not better than, in some cases, a letter of intent for that purpose. And the reason I'm saying that is because if then what you're really looking for is to attract funding, our experience has been that funders are looking for more than a letter of intent. So at that point, we found that it's been um, overall more useful to that entrepreneur to have an option agreement, to have something more substantive, if that's really where they are in that process. If you're at that point where you're, you're doing some um, consideration, you're setting the business plan, you're having very early conversations with funders, some sort of lighter agreement might work perfectly for you. But the question did seem to be about if you were then going to reach out to funders directly. And again, in our experience, um, those funders typically want to see a stronger form of agreement like an option. I'd like to note about this is that all you, one of the things we'll explore a little bit is how universities differ so much from university to university. And universities just have different practices. There's some now that won't do options that just do LOIs. And so they're, they're often you'll see when you talk to the university and talk to the tech transfer office, find out what is their, their MO. Do they do LOIs? Do they do options? And understand what they're, what they're willing to do. Um, the one thing I would, other thing I'd say about this is that if you're not the PI and you're out talking to investors, they're going to, they do like to see, it's helpful to have a piece of paper in your hand, whether, and honestly, I'm not sure it makes a big difference if it's an LOI or an option, but something that validates that you're talking to the university uh, and that, that you have a path to get it. And that helps a lot. And also, you know, the practice of investors will vary depending on what they need. I've seen venture rounds close um, based on an option agreement, you know, but I've also seen investors say, well, no, we really have to have the signed license to close it. Um, so it, 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 it all, you know, it depends like a lot of the answers. And we'll talk about more about all of these um, uh, in, in our next webinar, um, which is going to be on these pre-license agreements. Um, and, uh, so I'm going to, we're going to, we have a bunch of other questions, um, that, that have come in. I'm going to have us move on for the moment, but we're going to get to all these questions. I think probably after the next set, um, section, the one thing I wanted you guys to think about in the meantime, because we did get a question about if we could give, um, if you could give an example of a startup that did not work. So I'm going to have you think about that over the next section. Uh, and we'll, we'll answer that one as well. So thanks everyone for all these terrific questions coming in. We will. Uh, get to them um, uh, uh, very shortly. So, um, so our our next subject today is to review the key stakeholders from each side uh, of the startup and the university. And the academic side, as I mentioned, is is particularly complex. So we'll be going into quite a bit of detail here. So next slide, Nikisha. Sure. So here we've listed the most common university stakeholders, and there are several. But what we haven't outlined specifically is that it's important, so important for companies to understand who are the stakeholders and what the individual interests are in the technology. Um, not all the stakeholders will have aligned interests, even if it's at the same institution. This is so important to note. Um, these interests don't always have an effect on the economic, but it could affect timing with respect to getting a deal completed. So knowing early can lead to an early understanding and further, further an early resolution to non-aligned interests. Not understanding the interest can lead to significant delays on the back end of a negotiation. So my advice is ask, ask, and ask again. Who are the relevant stakeholders and what are their interests? We know um, we will now specifically speak to some of the specific stakeholders, beginning with government. And I don't know if anybody wants to add to that particular component or not. OK, well, next slide. So as Nikisha just mentioned, the government as a sponsor and funder can be a key stakeholder. And when we think about government funding, we usually are talking about the Bayh-Dole Act, which formed the basis for much of university tech transfer. Prior to the act passing in 1980, the federal government was responsible for managing innovations, including patenting them and licensing them. And a number of researchers were very frustrated with the fact that their technologies weren't moving forward through that process. And they spoke to their senators and it happened to be in conjunction with the time that there was an economic report that came out. And these two factors really led to this act. 
And the act allows universities, other nonprofits, and small businesses to have assignment of their federally funded inventions. So this was huge. Now research that have been funded by the government can be assigned to universities, nonprofits, small companies, and they could manage their own research, file their own patents, have their own licenses. And as you can see from just some of the data on this slide for the last 25 years, that's been a giant step forward in terms of the economics, patents, and companies formed. And of course, there's the side to this that the under the Biodole Act, universities must use income that's generated from licensing that we do to support further research. So that keeps this cycle going. We also share a portion of the income with the inventors. And I'll say as a graduate researcher, that was really beneficial to me. My technologies had gotten licensed out, which is very different than when I was in a startup also creating <laughs> and um, didn't have that same benefit. There's also a requirement for substantial manufacturing in the US if you're an exclusive licensee. This has come up in a few of our cases where we're working with companies that are either foreign based or their manufacturing is. And uh, there's a waiver process that can um, alleviate the situation for those exclusive licenses. And then also there's a preference for small business under the act. And that really has been one of the components to facilitate this boom in, in startups and especially in startups coming out of universities. And I think, Rick, you had some things that you'd like to add. Yeah, yeah. It, it's hard to understate the impact that Bayh-Dole has on technology transfer from U.S. universities, even for technologies that are not federally funded. And federal funding does make up a majority of the research, substantial majority of the research funding that goes into U.S. universities. So the policies and practices are geared, one thing is for Bayh-Dole compliance. And one example is that you could see examples on the slide of some things that will permeate themselves you know, in the licenses like the substantial manufacturing in the US for exclusive licenses. A another example has to do with there's restrictions in Bayh-Dole on transferring patents without federal agency approval. And as a result of this, patents are only rarely assigned by universities and, and tech transfer is really focused around licensing not assigning the patents. And sometimes, you know, companies are like, hey, I've got all rights to it, I'm paying for it, I really should own it. But that's not gonna, it's not gonna work out that way here. And practices do, do differ in other countries. So in some countries, it's commonplace to assign patents, the result from university research, but, you know, by dole casts this very large, uh, this really large influence on the way things are done. And another aspect to consider about by dole is how relatively recent the legislation is. So in many cases, we're dealing with universities that are at least over a century old and possibly a couple centuries or more old and have developed their structures around their research and education missions. And then in the last 40 years, this new thing has come along called tech transfer. And since then, the, the, you know, the number of tech transfer offices, the number of tech transfer professionals, it's really exploded. And it's a very, you know, to some extent, it's a very new and evolving field. And, um, and, and so, you know, the universities weren't formed with this in mind and they adapt to it. And that's, you know, one of the reasons we see things, why there are all these different stakeholders that have to be considered. These stakeholders have been around for, for much longer than by Dole. Yeah. And the tech transfer office really works like a small business within the university. And sometimes that's an excellent fit. Sometimes that's a little bit of a, a sticky fit, but it also um, can be to the advantage of the company because we do really bridge that. So we understand the business perspective and the research perspective and try to bring those into alignment. And the one other last thing I mentioned, it, it gets to a point Nikisha raised earlier about recruitment and retention or advancement, I guess is really the thing about advancement is, you know, how, you know, universities are now coming to think more about how the, you know, patenting and commercialization actually plays into the tenure process because traditionally it was not on the map. And it's, it's a relatively new um, conversation at universities on how that plays in. Great, next slide. Sure. So we're gonna emphasize this point throughout um, intellectual property rights lead from funding. And so knowing where the funding is coming from, what the rights are that are associated are really key. And we just reviewed some of the ones related to federal funding. And that is, as mentioned, the majority of university funds but there can be similar requirements from sponsored research. So often here, the sponsor has the option to license the technology developed under their sponsorship. And in some cases, those rights can be even broader where the intellectual property is concerned. 
also for research coming from foundations. We're seeing more and more frequently that foundations are interested in replenishing their foundation funds to do more research. And so um, there, there's really been an uptick in the intellectual property requirements around research done under foundation grants. So something to be aware of. And then for internal research funds and state funds, these can have special terms. They can vary fairly wide, widely. So I was trying to think of one that could be a bit consistent and that might be that um, under university or state sponsorship, it may bring in IP. So it may um, ask for assignment of intellectual property created under the research by researchers outside the university as well as those inside the university. Overall, really know where the funding came from for the research that you're interested in and what ties there might be to it, what third party rights there could be, as those are gonna be really essential to know as you enter into any license agreement. Does anybody wanna add anything to this slide? Okay, then I'm gonna to jump to the, to the next stakeholder, which are the inventors. And often the technology is that's leaving the university is leaving at a fairly early stage in terms of product research and development. It can have excellent research behind it, but to, again, to have it go from a research project to a commercial product, that's a big arc. And we're typically at the beginning of that arc for most technologies. And so having the inventor be on board is almost always key for the startup. And those inventors have multiple potential areas of interest. They can include the financial, um, not only from potential distributions from the license, but if it's a startup, they're also going to be interested in their equity position. It can also be what I'm gonna call positional. So this goes back to that advancement component. Um, this might be something that is important to them in terms of their career goals. And that can be either at the university or that can be as part of the startup. Maybe as a co-founder, they're interested in having a larger role than a scientific advisory role. That's uh, something that I will absolutely highlight as being important to know. Um, if, if your researcher wants to be part of the C-suite of the startup, that's very important to hash out as early as possible. Um, also, some of the areas of interest can be reputational. This can be a way to highlight their research in both the academic and the business community and potentially expand that impact to their technology. So as you're talking with researchers, really understand which of these are important to them. It absolutely can be all. Um, it may be more that one is important, more important than another. And knowing that upfront and then reassessing it as you go on is something that I definitely recommend. And now Nikisha is going to introduce some additional university stakeholders. Sure. Important to note that each institution will have its own mechanism for managing sponsored research and technology transfer. Some institution will have a combined office where they can manage the combined agreements where others may have two separate offices um, that manage the two types of agreements and they literally will not combine the components of a sponsored research and a license agreement. So understanding how a university operates and what the constraints are is really important. I will say though, in, in most instances, universities will work to try and create connectivity as best as possible between the two offices and the two types of contracts. So grants and sponsored research offices typically negotiates agreements related to funding for a specific project. Um, and then the technology transfer office may be consulted on intellectual property details within that sponsored project. Specifically, the IP section of a sponsored, uh, sponsored research agreement will be one where the tech transfer office will want to ensure that all of the language is consistent with their practices with respect to transferring the IP and that there are anything that's going to provide uh, uh, any concerns for the university moving forward. Uh, if a sponsor then is interested in a license that results from the pro um, project IP, the tech transfer office will negotiate um, such an agreement uh, in the form of a license. Um, and, and as Lisa mentioned earlier, many times the sponsored research agreement will have perhaps option considerations already in it. It will really guide the negotiations for the license. Um, and, and so um, I, I'll move on to the next slide. So um, then in the event that there is a startup that is to be based on a university technology, um, entrepreneurship and new venture programs may be available through the university 
or tech transfer office to assist in this effort. Uh, to remain relevant and empower emerging thinkers and academic path, uh, pathways to success, the universities are introducing these campus spaces where uh, students and faculty can connect to fellow entrepreneurs and some interested financiers. Everybody wants to be connected to the money where possible. So these new places are called academic incubators. Um, and they have helped universities really prepare the next generation by creating environments that facilitate connections. Connections are really important. We all talk about networking and, and to push innovative ideas from concept to reality. I think many universities talk about bench to bedside, which is kind of, uh, kind of this commercialization concept of, uh, of pushing a technology from right off the bench to a commercial product. Um, so these incubators are many times a startup resource where those interested can receive, I've said it before, specific education and training, rent subsidized office and research space, which can be really useful for a new startup that is uh, fund limited, um, with the hope that they eventually grow out of the incubator space. Um, many of these programs will utilize mentors and residents. I think Lisa and Rick both mentioned these, and these mentors and residents have industry experience to provide guidance, help in assessing specific technologies, they help you learn how to pitch, and provide real life examples of what it takes to be successful in a startup. Uh, I mean, they'll tell you sometimes as a startup, you may be, there may be three members of the startup and everybody's sweeping the floors. You need to know that these may be components that you have to do. Um, um, then there's the i program, and this is a government program that has been really useful for many tech transfer office, and it uses experiential education to help researchers gain insight, again, into entrepreneurship, starting a business, and perhaps some of the challenges of starting this business. What's really great about i is the business team starts with an idea, and they use what's called primary market research to determine if their business idea is really sound. So this is boots on the ground. They interview their proposed market base to determine if their product is really kind of what the people want. Um, finally, um, some of the programs may provide funding. Um, some may not. Some may just provide resources to direct you to funding. Um, and many will um, be able to introduce you to venture groups, provide opportunities to pitch via competitions, et cetera. All great experiences that startups will need moving towards their next step. So, so I, have a, I have a quick question in here for, for you, um, just because you mentioned i and this is a different government program, and it's on SBIR, STTR. Someone asked about, do you recommend that startups take an option or a license prior to submission of an application for SBIR, STTR funding, or you know, does it matter at that point? And, and Nikisha uh, or Lisa, can you answer that? Lisa, do you Sure, so I'll say that um, a number of our researchers that applied for an SBIR, STTR, don't have an option at the point that they're applying. And typically the pro program manager is gonna require that at the time that the grant is approved. Um, if they already have an option or license, fantastic. Um, if it makes sense for them to do it, if there's some other reason that they need to, but for the purposes of the grant, it's, it's not usually a necessary component. It can be a nice to have as opposed to a need to have. Yeah, I would say that um, look at the specific STTR or STTR or state grant funding requirements. So I know uh, specifically in Maryland, there are some state grants that can go to a researcher, but that eventually can, um, uh, the researcher, if they're looking to do a startup, that startup for that second round of funding would have to have a license in hand before they'd actually get their funding. So again, look at the details of the program that you're applying for and ask, ask, ask. Many times the tech transfer office or the entrepreneurial office will have uh, people that are employed to help startups navigate these considerations. Just as one additional here for the i program, it's really been an excellent way for a number of our startup teams and research teams as well to define their customers and market and pivot at the stage where it's much easier to do so. So if you have access to that program or some of the other associated programs that come before i uh, I highly recommend utilizing those resources. It just really helps set your company and your product up for success earlier. 
And Rick, there's another question about SBIR and STTR that I, I think I should direct to you, which was, um, what advice would you give to faculty founders who are considering incorporation simply because they want to apply for SBIR or STTR funding? What would you suggest in, in lieu of taking this step? Or do you suggest that, that they move forward this way? Well, I think I, I, this is one thing where I'm not aware of exactly how the timing works, but to actually get the grant, you need to have an entity. And uh, so, and I'm not sure if it's similar to what um, Nikisha described, where you just have to have it formed um, before the grant is actually made. So that's that that will get into the, the the specifics of the actual grant, and then you get all those fun questions about what kind of entity. But that's that's beyond the scope of. Okay. Um, right. I, I would also suggest again the SBIR and STTR uh, resource officers are there to help you. So please utilize all the resources that are available. Call them, set up Zoom calls to have a conversation and have them walk you through the process. Great. Um, and, and actually someone on here had, had uh, said that they also provide, uh, they, they know more about these things too. So they're happy to provide more information. But um, I, Rick, we should probably go on to the next slide where you, you talked about, I think of the, um, uh, startups, the company stakeholders, and then we'll probably quickly go through the next session because we got a ton of questions from from people as well. Um, so, okay, well, fortunately, the company stakeholders um, section is much shorter than the university stakeholders section. <laughs> and for the universities, the presence of these stakeholders is known, and their presence is felt at the table when licenses are being created. If even if they're not directly there, they're indirectly influencing the tech transfer process. For the startup, uh, it can be very different because the founders and management team, you know, likely be at the table. But the other stakeholders uh, may all be future stakeholders who aren't identified yet. And the founders need to do their best to accommodate these future stakeholders based on their best hypothesis on where the business is going, but to also build flexibility for pivots um, with things based on which way the business may go. So I just kind of going down the list. Well, the first one's investors, and that's that's going to be a necessary element, usually pretty early on. Sometimes people can bootstrap or get, you know, get SBIR type money to uh, non-dilutive money to, to carry it along. But often at some point, they will need to um, bring in investors and be structuring the agreement economically in a way that makes sense and is attractive to the investors. Customers is an interesting one because a lot of times you don't actually know where you're going to go in the value chain, whether you're going to maybe providing just a component, whether you're going to be providing a, you know, a full finished product, um, or maybe even a service. And this, you know, if you're, if you're, just, if you're doing drug discovery, it's probably pretty clear that you're going to be, um, you're looking to create a drug. Um, but in a lot of other businesses, there can be a lot of uncertainty about exactly who your customer is going to be. And so when you get to the license, that takes can take a bit of creativity in thinking through what are the different scenarios and how does that play out and setting up, for example, different royalty models, depending on which way you take your business. Um, Sublicensee is another one. This is one that is actually, I feel like, and we're going to cover it in, in much more depth later on, as Kirsten mentioned, but there can be a lot of tensions on working through, a lot of issues to work through, I should say, sublicensing. Um, and for a lot of startups, you know, the idea of sublicensing is I have my license, but now I'm going to license these rights to a third party who can then go forward and make products based on that. And for a lot of startups, they think, um, and rightfully so, they probably have no intention of sublicensing, although the license is going to start with that. But there's other businesses where, um, and, you know, drug discovery is a, a good one where there's really expectations around sublicensing. And those sublicensees aren't at the table yet but structuring the license in the first place in a way that makes sense is a, is a lot of hypothesizing um, uh, to get it right. Uh, and also, you know, we, we have on here, oh, academic institution is a great one because at some point you're going to get the license and you're going to be very, you know, in a lot of ways, you're going to be very aligned at that point. And at that point, the university is going to be your champion and is going to want you to succeed. Now, that's not going to say there can't be tensions that are going to, you know, may develop. Um, but, the, but the university will become an important stakeholder once you get the license. And the last one I want to mention is potential acquirers. And, you know, it's not a secret that um, most companies, especially if you're going for venture backing, the plan is to sell the company. 
And that's what people's incentives are based on, on, on management's incentive, certainly on the inventor's incentive who, who are investing usually with some finite time frame for there to be a sale of the company. And when you're structuring the license in the first place, you may be imagining who that acquirer is because for example, you may have a particular kind of customer, but that customer may change once the license goes in the hands of a much bigger um, established company. So those are those are the you know, these different stakeholders who often aren't directly at the table, but their the, the, their future presences are felt. Great, thanks, thanks, Rick. Um, and before we move on to the next section, so we're going to actually wait on the questions until the next section is very short, um, and we're going to get through the the main substance of, of this particular webinar. A lot of the questions we're getting in actually are things that we're going to be discussing in future webinars, but we understand people want some answers. Uh, potentially right now on those. Uh, so we'll, 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 get to the, we'll get to those that we can. Uh, one, one person did comment that you must have an ent a company prior to applying for an SBIR, STTR funding, which is I think actually what you were saying, Rick, um, but that you don't have to have a license or option. So just someone backing us up on, on, on I think what our, what our panel was saying, which is great. Um, okay, so before we get to questions, let's just go on to the next session. So um, thank you guys for delving into the key stakeholders. We'll take a little bit of time now to talk about stakeholder expectations uh, of the negotiation and the license. Um, we're not going to dive deep in here at all in the university side because actually that was we, we were kind of setting that up with the, the previous when we talked about the stakeholders and what they are expecting on the last um, several slides. So on next slide, uh, we'll start off um, with the overall expectations. And I mean, a lot of this is really obvious here, but they're really the same as in any relationship, respect and fairness. Um, as we've mentioned before, the relationship does not end when the license is signed. It's just the beginning. So consider how you will be communicating and evolving um, that re this relationship in the years to come and how to set a good stage for that actually to be the case. Um, so that, uh, you know, we already talked a little bit about amending the license agreement, uh, you know, most startups uh, agreements that are successful end up being amended at some point because things change. Uh, the universities expect that, et cetera. So you want to set up a communication path, um, a way of, of doing things where, um, uh, you know, you, you set it up for success at the beginning, uh, it, knowing that it's going to evolve as time goes on. Uh, so, uh, Rick, you're going to talk about from the company side, the ex expectations on the next slide. Yes. And. I'm not going to go, everyone can, can, can read the bullet points, so I'm not going to read through them, but I want to highlight two things on here, the first and the last bullet points. The first one is the one of the things the company is expecting is that they're getting some technology and intellectual property of commercial value. And one important point I'd like to make here is that's really on the company to figure out. And what you'll see, and we'll get this, I probably it's the fifth webinar series, the university isn't going to promise anything about the intellectual property. And it's, it puts the onus uh, in many ways on the company. It's really an as, in many ways, it's an as is license with, with some maybe very narrow exceptions. It's an as is license. And so the onus is really on the company to do its homework, you know, whether it's on the patents to understand the patent landscape uh, or um, you know, what exactly is covered? What is the value here and what, what, what are they getting? So sometimes people will come in and they'll say, oh, well, I expect that I really was going to be getting a finished product from the university. And it's actually really the opposite. It's really what people will say when they go to university. It's early stage. You know, it wasn't research done. Often it's not research done with the goal of making a commercial product. It's research done for that, I think we talked about earlier, that curiosity, that scientific curiosity to expand, you know, knowledge in the field. Uh, so it, it really is on the companies um, to, to make its own assessment of that value. The last one, I'll, then the last bullet on this one is autonomy. And this is one that really comes up in license negotiations. And this, this takes, I think, I feel like a lot of finesse on both parties' side in it. To be, and I, I work with startups right now, and to be super, you know, the way that most startups see it is they really don't want to go to the university for permission for anything. Okay, they set up the license, they're, you know, they'll take the economics, they'll take the obligations. And I think Lisa hinted this earlier, there's going to be diligence obligations, you're going to have to move the technology forward or give the give the IP back, but they don't want to have to ask for approvals. And 
there, there are some cases that make universities uncomfortable, like sublicensing and acquisition, where maybe they want the approval right. So, um, you know, that is one where we find frequently there's, there's, you know, issues that have to be worked through and flexibility on both party sides to try to make it work for um, for for both sides and and I've certainly seen it um, with venture capitalists who really want to have that autonomy and maybe you might be talking to the founders but the VCs want that autonomy just as much because they're they're building a company to do all these things and and to them there shouldn't be a reason they have to go ask the university for approval they really want to get that autonomy we'll, we'll I'm sure we'll we'll touch on that more and later yeah, we will. Um, so what I'm going to do is because we have, we have a number of questions to get to and we have 18 minutes left. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you each some questions and I'm going to direct the question to one of you uh, and then we'll move on to the next question unless someone else wants to, to chime in as well. Um, and so the first one I'm going to ask is, uh, can you outline uh, the conflict of interest issues for a researcher who wants to uh, start a company? And so Lisa, I'll start with you on this one. Sure. Uh, it is fairly university dependent. Uh, it can also relate back to state law and your outside work policy. So think about what you would like to do as part of the company. That's going to be one facet of it. There are typically going to be um, procedures that you need to follow about outside work, limitation on the amount of time that you can spend. Uh, there may also be a uh, limit or a ceiling on what kind of role you can have at the company while maintaining your university position. Uh, there are also going to be questions about whether you have a stake in the company, how that could affect research, whether you can be the PI on a clinical trial. Um, and then there are ones that occurred during the process of the negotiation. So depending on the university, uh, you may be able to participate directly in that negotiation. You may even be able to be the signatory for that license. I'll say that's not the case at the University of Washington. We make sure that our, yeah, Nikisha shaking her head as well. Um, so uh, um, we do have our researchers who are involved in the startup. They're able to see the process, but they can't guide the financial aspects of it. And um, that's because they are conflicted. And the nature of that conflict is maybe what's important to state here. As a university employee and as a researcher employed to do research, that's the scope of your employment. That's how it's looked at. And so this other component, that's not a component of research, it's a potentially great extension of your research, can then be seen as posing a conflict for your UW employment. And also, um, in addition to asking questions of your department and the tech transfer office, if you're the researcher, there's usually going to be an office that manages those conflicts. That's actually also part of what the Bayh-Dole Act helped us set up. Um, and, um, and also, um, anyway, uh, but talk to the conflicts office, understand what the potential conflicts are. It's great to know what those are beforehand so that you aren't trying to rework things after you find yourself unintentionally conflicted. Yeah, and there's typically a requirement for most universities to disclose your involvement other companies. So make sure you're being compliant <laughs> with your university policy. Right. And if you have any questions about what those policies are, et cetera, again, just go to your tech transfer office. They will direct you to the right places um, or if someone else, uh, you know, perhaps in your department can, but the tech transfer office will get you to the right place. All right. So next question, um, and Rick, I'm going to direct this one to you. So how does the agreement in terms of power distribution, and maybe this is also equity distribution, uh, usually work between a researcher and a founder who approaches them? So this is obviously going to be early on. Um, how 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 does how does that agreement uh, typically work? How do you see that working? Usually, it really it depends a lot in terms of who is behind the. Um, it sounds like the, it sounds like we're we're positing a case where there's some business people um, or, or existing management team that are that are partnering with a researcher and it sounds like maybe the researcher is going to be a co-founder or head of scientific advisory board, which are common things for the researcher to do. And what you'll see is if it's venture backed. So there's, uh, there's, there's, especially on the biotech side, there's venture firms that do a lot of university spin outs and have their systems of working with PIs and other university researchers. And 
you know, I'd say in those cases, it really can vary from the, the VC to the VC. Some really just keep them in the, in the you know, research role. Um, there's other I've seen that are more collaborative and it just depends. And there are, there are ranges of equity that you can expect. I'm not gonna go into that right now, um, but there's sort of some ranges of equity depending on the role that you can expect after a series A financing. But one thing I would say, especially on the biotech side where you're, where you're bringing large amounts of money in and there's actually pretty significant dilution up front is the researcher in a lot of those cases um, isn't gonna have a, a huge say in terms of the business direction. That you hope that they're gonna have a, you know, a say in the, in, the, in the science side of it, but, but usually not. Um, in the in the business direction. Now it can it can vary though. There can be other cases where you're not starting with VC money at the beginning. There's cases where just the researchers are just really going it alone. And I use Google as an example up front, where the power is they have 100% of the power because they're they're doing it themselves, and that's certainly an established model. And you know where it goes from there. I mean I've I've seen kind of all different shades from. You know, a lot of times people splitting things equally and or one or the other having a majority. I've sort of seen all permutations and it's really um, dependent on the circumstance. And I think that, that that's sort of like a whole nother webinar on how you do startup equity. But, you know, the one key thing is that the equity has got to go where really the value is being provided and in, on a long term basis so that a year down the road, the investors are thinking the people who have the equity are the right people to really drive this business forward. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Nikisha, I'm going to ask the next question of you. Um, it's if the university has only submitted a provisional patent, uh, patent application on the technology of interest, to what degree does it make sense to engage on IP? So I think engage in license discussions is the question. So it's, it's quite normal for institutions and companies to engage in licenses um, where there's just a provisional application. Um, it, again, uh, Many companies will, would like to tell us, oh, well, there's no guarantee that the IP is going to issue. We know. This is kind of you getting in at early stage to have access at the, of the technology early on, to have a say in some regards with respect to how the university prosecutes the patent application, because we're going to be considering your product as we move along. Um, so it's quite normal for um, a company to engage in either option or licensing discussions at the provisional stage or anywhere throughout the, the life of the patent prosecution, not necessarily just at um, the execution of the patent. Quite frankly, sometimes if you wait, that particular technology that you want, it might be gone by the time it's issued. I wanna add one point to that, which is sometimes people will come in thinking, well, the patent's not issued yet, so the royalty should be lower. That's, that's not the norm. And, and you can make those arguments, but it's not the norm and it's not market. And it's funny, I, we, I, was, I see it very rarely. In one case I saw it, the company actually got product to market before the patent was issued. And then the university went back and renegotiated because everyone agreed it really wasn't fair because <laughs> the university weren't getting the royalties and they were exploiting the technology. So you can certainly make arguments you know, against it, but it's not market to, um, to have that differential royalty rate. So, um, no royalty rate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the next question, um, and, and I'm I'm gonna um, I'm gonna answer this one a little bit first. <laughs> so the next question was, would an option agreement or an exclusive license be more attractive to investors? And can you get? And then the, the next part of the question was, and can you give us a general idea of uh, on standard option terms? So I'm just gonna comment on this first. Is that um, there are a lot of investors who want to have input on what the terms are in your license agreement. Uh, you know, and it depends on the investor. So uh, in many ways, an option agreement may be the better way to start off with. Uh, and if they want to be involved then in those full license negotiations, they can be. Um, Nikisha, and Lisa, anything you want to add to that or Rick? I agree. We frequently see that that uh, really interested and experienced VC is going to want to have comments to the option or the license. Um, we have seen it where they've asked the startup to go back and renegotiate with us because they'd like a different term. Um, you know, we, we are able to come to an agreement, um, but I will say, I, I agree, it's easier to do that at the option stage for everybody. I think I agree. It just depends. <laughs> it depends. Yeah. Every, every agreement is different. 
But as we, Rick said very early on, having at least sometimes that paper in hand really gives you at least a, that leg up with the investors. Like, okay, you actually, the university's working with you uh, on this. So having that letter of intent or option agreement. And we'll be talking a lot more about those in our next webinar. Um, and then as far as um, standard option terms, this really varies very much by university to university. And honestly, I can't, I cannot comment on this. Um, uh, that is a conflict for me. Um, but uh, you know, just talk with your university and, and some universities really do have very set standard option terms. Like they just like, this is what they do for everyone. Others, it's a, a bit more flexible. So you need to talk with the university, but they're usually just not uh, incredibly onerous uh, because what they're trying to do is help you go forward be able to make those um, conversations uh, uh, with whoever it is you need to make uh, conversations with, uh, do that initial uh, perhaps proof of concept research that you want to do to, to validate whether you want to go forward with this. Um, okay, so we have eight minutes left and we still have a lot of questions, but a lot of these questions are things we're going to be answering in future webinars. Um, uh, so um, one of the things that I did want to really um, have you comment on quickly on one of these questions was, can you, could you comment on how to best deal with failed startups uh, and the licensed option and technology? And I think that's just interesting because um, I don't think it was actually something that we were contemplating for the next one, but it is something that we, um, that does come up. Is there any, any advice that anyone has here just uh, in the next minute or so? Sure. Um, one of the things that I'll say is to help your startup not be a failed startup. Uh, we see very few failures that are based on the technology. I've seen one and it was so incredibly painful. It was the researcher's own startup and they just couldn't replicate the technology to the level that they had anticipated. They were, um, they were about to get their series A funding and turned it down because they weren't able to replicate it. So unusual, it's almost never the technology. It can be that the market's changed or is moving so um, to the best of your ability, make sure that you know where the market is going and where your technology and your customers are. Almost always that breakdown, the failure of the startup is the team. And, um, uh, you know, I can see nodding because that unfortunately really is the case. Um, it is a partnership. Uh, being part of a startup, you are putting your whole self into it typically. And if you aren't in alignment with your other teammates, um, that is going to create big cracks early and often they're very hard if not impossible to come back from. So um, I would make sure that um, you check in on that alignment and also um, for university researchers there's a, there's almost always a point where your involvement is get a sunset so you might be incredibly involved at the beginning but if you're staying at the university your role may decrease likely will decrease over time Knowing that from the outset can uh, potentially save some of these challenges later on, but they're not the only ones. Um, so I, I would say team, um, and in terms of how we uh, interact with that, we certainly try to prevent that. We try to make sure that the people involved are asking the right questions of each other and checking in over time. Uh, and we frequently find ourselves in a counseling role and um, it's really hard. It's, it's awful to see when things break apart like that. So where it makes sense to bring parties back together, we always do try to do that. But if you can avoid it, that's always gonna be better. I'd also add, yeah, I'd also add that um, uh, perhaps university startups, faculty-based startups that don't have a reasonable management person in place, someone who knows kind of commercialization, understands that um, sometimes can fail. Um, University investigators are wonderful. They do what they do best, which is the research. They don't always necessarily translate that into uh, business management team. So I know we encourage our researchers to get a reasonable management person in place to do the business part of it. Um, and, and we've seen one or two startups that haven't been successful simply because the in investigators didn't want to relinquish that control to someone who was the business person. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to be negative about researchers. I think they're wonderful. I think they should remain as uh, scientific founders um, in the company so that they can give what they give best, and that's the scientific information. I want to, from my perspective, I mean, I think Nikisha makes a great point about, like, science, if you get the wrong business person in, like, that's can be really painful because the company will just languish and 
and it can be hard to get rid of them. And then the company doesn't go anywhere. I've seen many successful researcher led ones and I've seen them where maybe there was a business person at first, but the person actually wasn't needed. And that the researchers really will, were able to mature into the CEO role. And for the right type of you know, PhD who understands it and who's got the curiosity and the other people skills and whatever skills um, to do it, they can, you know, I, I go back to Paige and Bryn. I mean, there's in a lot of cases, the researchers can do it, um, but not always. There's certainly cases where you need, you need professional management or experience management. The one other thing I want to say is that failure is okay. And um, look, you're starting something that doesn't exist. There's a lot of hypotheses about what's going to do, where the market's going to be going, what the technology, what the costs are, what the customers are going to be willing to buy. There's a ton of risk. And so, you know, failure's okay. And, and don't not do it because of the failure. It's do it, you know, do your best. And, you know, the, in Silicon Valley, you know, failure is a, is a, you know, a badge of, you know, accomplishment. You know, you need to have learned those lessons sometimes before you, you know, you hit on your wild success. So, you know, don't, I, you know, I don't necessarily see if, if failure means the company didn't achieve its objectives that that's not necessarily um, a negative reflection. I agree, Rick, if, if they've learned something then they haven't uh, really failed. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, yeah. I, we only have a, a couple of minutes left. Um, uh, can we go to the next slide? Cause I just wanted to make sure there wasn't anything that we, um, we did not. Um, so let's go to the next slide after that. Um, uh, Lisa, is there anything quickly you wanted or, or, or Nikisha that you wanted to cover on this slide? Um, we will be sending these out to everyone. So I think we've covered some of these. One that people might not be familiar with is bond financing considerations. So there's tax exempt bond financing that can be used to fund buildings, which many universities utilize. And one requirement of that funding is that only 5% of the building can be used for what's called private business use. So that might limit the amount of corporate sponsored research that your particular researcher can do if um, the research going into that building is reaching that 5%. You would think that this is a one-off. We're actually seeing it more and more often, um, partly because of the number of buildings that we have that fall under this particular financing. If, if, if I could comment quickly on the first one, intellectual property, if any of the researchers or any of the current employees at the university are gonna be involved with the startup, it's really critical to understand what the university's policy IP ownership policy is, because they can really vary greatly from university to university. And some can make them actually very difficult for the researcher to work with the company and have the company own it. So it, it's this issue of who owns the work the researcher does and how that's defined. And in many cases, it's defined in a way that if you do everything outside the university, don't use university resources, the company can own it. You can have an advisor agreement or consulting agreement or SAB whatever that assigns ownership to the company. On the other hand, there's some um, university IP policies that, you know, maybe if it's in the, I'm paraphrasing, but if it's within the researcher's area of expertise, which can be very broad and encompass a lot of things that the university may assert ownership of it and create some conflicts with what the, the, the company thought they were getting. So I encourage you that if you are going to be working, having university researchers on your team, go find the university IP policy and understand what it says about ownership. Great. Thanks, Rick. I'm going to have um, Natasha actually flip to our last, actually second to last slide, which will just show what we're going to be talking about in our next webinar. Um, uh, we did not get to all the questions that were asked to us today, and I'm really sorry about that. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to provide those questions to our panelists, um, have them write out a short answer, and we'll send that to all of the registrants because a lot of these came in anonymously. Uh, so everyone should have at least uh, some, some brief answers to those questions as well, and I'm sorry that we ran out of time. Our next session is on the licensing process where we'll um, talk about the University Technology Circle of Life. Don't know what that is? We'll tell you on the next webinar. Uh, we'll talk about academic personnel, their priorities and, and perspectives, um, startup due diligence, as well as the university's diligence on the startup itself. And then those pre-license and other agreements that we've already touched on some today uh, and obviously are so of interest to our audience as well. Um, we do have a survey. If anyone, uh, it should be popping up in your chat box now, or uh, I think also when you leave, it will come out to you. Please fill out our survey. It does really make a difference. We'll also know in future webinars, including this series, what it is that you want to hear from us um, uh, about. Um, uh, so uh, Natasha just put that in your chat box. If you could fill out, that would be great. 
other questions that you have, these are the email addresses for our panelists. Feel free to reach out to them with any other questions that you have. Thank you all so much. I, so many of you stuck with us for this full hour and a half. Uh, really appreciate that. Lisa, Nikisha, Rick, thank you so much for spending so much time, not only today, but previously in developing this presentation. And I know um, all the work that we still have going on in the future for this series of webinars. Uh, so everyone, um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for all the questions. Uh, thank you uh, for your participation today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye. Yeah, thanks.